morning, I want you to open your Bibles to the book of 1 John, chapter 4. 1 John, chapter 4. First John chapter 4, and I'm going to read the first three verses there. First John chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Bob Jones Sr. would say, a man who preaches the Bible should be able to teach people something along the way. And someone who is a teacher of the Bible should do it evangelistically. That office, pastors and teachers, uh, is an office joined together in Paul's list of New Testament officers. And uh, so it's my endeavor, it's my hope that when I preach, that I, I teach you something along the way. And I'm not a snotter and a snorter and a belcher from the pulpit. Maybe if you want that kind of preaching, I'm the wrong guy. I'm sorry. That's just not my style of public speaking. But uh, whatever God lays on my heart, I trust and pray that it is helpful to what you need and that each one of us can receive the blessing God wants us to have from it uh, week by week. The spirit of Antichrist is alive in the world now, according to verse 3. And it will only get worse until the great deceiver, the Antichrist, appears in the world and begins this campaign of blasphemy against the Lord Jesus Christ. The little prefix, anti, on the word doesn't only mean he's against Jesus Christ, but it also means a replacement for, instead of, Christ. Uh, both meanings are found in the word of God. Who opposeth, there's the anti part, and exalteth himself above, there's the instead of part, all that is called God or that is worshipped. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. He wants to replace Jesus Christ in the hearts and in the minds and in the loyalties of men, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The cults and we might add the translators of modern versions of the Bible and liberal Protestant denominations for generations, all of them have been paving the way, they've been laying the groundwork, laying the foundation for the Antichrist to appear one day. Revelation 3 verse 14 reads, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The JWs take that to mean that Jesus Christ was the first thing God created, and then Christ made everything else. Their Bible, the New World Translation, refers to the Lord Jesus as the only begotten God, John 1 verse 18, thus making Jesus a lesser God than the Heavenly Father exactly as the New American Standard Version rendered it in 1964. One Mormon founder uh, named Lorenzo Snow famously said, as man is now, God once was. As God is now, man may become. And really all of the Mormon presidents have taught that philosophy in one form or another. You can become God, too, if you try hard enough. And the liberal, misguided Protestant denominations, by those I mean nearly all United Methodists, nearly all Methodists, all Lutherans, 
nearly all Presbyterians and virtually all Congregationalists, all Episcopalians, want to diminish the role of the Lord Jesus Christ as the savior of sinners and turn him into some sort of social justice warrior who cares about global warming, who cares about gay marriage and abortion rights, because those are the things they care about. Paul wrote, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And he adds, of whom I am chief, 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. He said that in all things, he, Christ, might have the preeminence, Colossians 1, verse 18. John the Baptist said of Christ, he must increase, but I must decrease. John 3, verse 30. Any doctrines taught by men, any endeavors of any church um, that sort of wants to reduce the stature of the Lord Jesus Christ gradually and gradually elevate the stature of man is the spirit of Antichrist. So let's magnify Jesus Christ. <laughs> Sometimes we get and I know this is true of myself, sometimes we get sidetracked, we get distracted with little details about you know, how long the Antichrist's fingernails will be trimmed, or <laughs> whether the mark will be on the hand or in the hand, and you know, you know what, I'm just saying those things as examples. But we get distracted with some of that minutia, and we don't worship and remind ourselves who it is we love and who it is that saved us and everything about him that we should never lose sight of, that we should never forget about. So I, I call this uh, outline today, the birth of the eternal God, the birth of the eternal God. Now that might sound self-contradicting, self-contradictory. If someone is eternal, that he never had a birth. Or if you have a birth, how can you then say that someone was eternal, but not so. It's not a contradiction when we think of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, first of all, let's consider his pre-existence, his pre-existence. Before there was ever a heaven and an earth, before the uh, all of known reality uh, consisting of time, space, matter, and energy, wherever conceived, Jesus Christ was there. <laughs> Wrap your mind around that if you can. Before he was ever uh, born as a baby uh, and laid in a manger, born at Bethlehem and came into the world, he existed in eternity. The verse that prophesied his birthplace also spoke of his existence in eternity. And thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Micah 5, verse 2. The Lord told Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Exodus 3, verse 14. God simply exists. There is no adequate explanation available or possible. There are not enough words uh, in all the human languages to fully describe how that a being could exist before anything else existed. So that definition, I am, hath sent me unto you, is going to have to suffice. So Christ Jesus said in John 8, verse 58, Before Abraham was, I am. And the Jews understood what he meant to imply. And so they took up stones and wanted to stone him for blasphemy. Paul wrote, For by him, Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, 
whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17. He holds the universe together because he made it. We believe not only did he make it, he was there before it. My definition. Whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Notice how the prophet Isaiah deals with this. Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That verse says, unto us a child is born. Well, that would be his physical birth in Bethlehem. And unto us a son is given. That was his status with the Heavenly Father before coming into the world. The Bible says, it pleased God, or, or when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. Galatians 4, verse 4. Then Isaiah refers to Christ as the mighty God and the everlasting Father. Well, those terms are only possible because of the nature of the Godhead, what the world calls the Trinity. The word Trinity, like that, is not found in the Bible, but the definition is certainly there. Remember the Lord Jesus said, John 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. Wrap your mind around that. John begins his gospel saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. John 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. I'm certain John couldn't fully understand it as he was writing it. Any more than you and I can fully grasp a hold of it, reading it. But then John refers to the Godhead, John 1.14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Think about that. The Eternal One who existed before time and space decided to enter into his own creation uh, in a life of flesh and blood to live among insignificant sinners like you and me. If you have a problem and you cry out to God for help, God cannot say to you, I understand. I know what you're talking about. If he's never gone through anything, but through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, God can now say, I know what it is to be cold. I know what it is to be hungry. I know what it is to be spat upon. I know what it is to be mocked. I know what it is to be talked about. I know what it is to be rejected. I know what it is to be refused by my own family members and my closest friends. I know what it is to be falsely charged and accused of being illegitimate and so forth. He knows all of those things. Paul echoes this idea when he says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. A verse that's been rewritten and perverted by all the modern versions of the Bible. The modern versions say, He who appeared in a body, or he was manifest, without telling you who was manifest, or who appeared in a body. They introduce the subject without any predicate. They don't identify who appeared in a body. And since Satan is going to appear in a body, they're getting the world ready to receive somebody who comes along, claiming to be a miraculous uh, appearance in the world of God. Listen to what Christ said about himself. 
For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth his life unto the world. John 3, or 6, verse 33. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. John 6, verse 51. Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. John 8, verse 23. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. John 16, verse 28. I proceeded forth and came from God. John 8, verse 42. In his prayer, the night before he was betrayed and crucified, he said, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with the glory which I had with thee, before the world was. John 17, verses 4 and 5. He said, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he spoke of me. John 5, verse 46. Then he said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. John 8, verse 56. Well, how could, excuse me, this thing makes me want to tear up and shout glory to God all the way through. How could Moses write about Jesus Christ, even in figure? Or how could Abraham rejoice at the prospect of a coming Redeemer if no such Redeemer existed at the time? Did they have complete knowledge? No. There's no indication they had full, complete knowledge. The nonsensical idea that people in the Old Testament were saved by looking forward to the cross. And just like you and I are saved by looking back at the cross. That's the lame uh, plan of salvation offered by radio ministers uh, from Calvary chapels and other places like. They don't know anything about rightly dividing the word of truth at all. You can't benefit from something if it hasn't happened yet. So somebody in the Old Testament couldn't have been saved and gone to heaven by looking forward. They're not saved on credit. By the way, let me just throw this in. The Bible says, In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. In fact, that prescription is given at least eight times throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament. If you want to establish a doctrine, you need at least two or better yet three verses of the Bible that all testify to each other and agree together. So when someone says people in the Old Testament were saved looking forward to the cross and the coming of Jesus, ask that person to give you at least two or better yet three Old Testament references to support that idea. And if they can't, write them off as children. They don't know what they're doing yet. But the Lord Jesus has always been co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Our first text, 1 John 4, verse 3, says, Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. The crucial word there being Christ, because that identifies him with the Holy Spirit or the Anointed One, the Messiah. The Revised Standard Version, 1952 says, every spirit that does not confess Jesus. The New International Version. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus. English Standard Version. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus. New Living Translation. Does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus. They conveniently leave out the word Christ and emphasize the name Jesus. Well, the name Jesus highlights his physical flesh and blood nature. Modern versions are spreading the spirit of Antichrist, trying to diminish the eternal nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. The dying thief next to Christ said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. In Luke 24. All the modern versions say, Jesus, remember me. They take the lordship out of the dying sinner's mouth at the moment of his conversion. 
But before he came into the world to be born of earthly parents, Jesus Christ existed from all eternity. And like I say, it's, it's much easier for us to say it and summarize it than it is to fully comprehend it. But Jesus existed before time and space were ever conceived of. Secondly, consider his virgin birth. I only have two points to this sermon today, his pre-existence, and secondly, his virgin birth. Lost religions want to mock the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together physically, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost, Matthew 1, verse 18. In 1985, a man named Robert Funk founded a group called the Jesus Seminar. Some of you may have heard of them. It was a group of about 50 Bible critics who would meet and then they would evaluate the claims of Jesus and they would issue reports to the news media on the authority of the Bible. And they got a lot of attention in the news back in the 1990s. But the seminar concluded, quote, Jesus was a mortal man born of two human parents who did not perform nature miracles nor die as a substitute for sinners nor rise bodily from the dead according to a Wikipedia article. In 2006, Mr. Funk died and went to hell. And the group uh, effectively disbanded. But liberal Protestant denominations all over this country thought these people were scholars. These people were experts. These people are rendered the final verdict. We finally have some intellects who can weigh in on the scriptures and the true nature of Jesus. That's why you hear, see these crazy movies about the true Christ or the lost gospel of Thomas, the lost gospel of Judas, and so forth. They're trying to reject the Bible, and the Jesus seminar would, uh, would really took issue with the gospel of John, because the gospel of John uh, emphasizes the deity of Jesus Christ more than any other book of the Bible. So we've got to downplay his deity and elevate the status of man and man's ability to earn his way. People who call themselves Christians but have never met Christ want to mock him, and they want to mock his virgin birth. As a matter of fact, turn quickly to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter 2, and notice verses 1 and 2. 2 Peter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says there, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. I know a man. He used to work at my place of employment, and he got elderly and retired, and his wife passed away, and so he's, you know, lonely at home, got nothing to do. So he shows up at our place of business, but he was also a part-time minister in a very liberal Protestant denomination. And he knew that I was a preacher, and he said, what did Jesus mean by this uh, saying, you must be born again. I've never been born again. Almost proud of it. And uh, one year on a Good Friday of all days, not that Good Friday is that important to you and me, but you get the idea. He came in on that day to sit in our break room, drink our coffee, and uh, he chose that day of all days to say, well, you know, Jesus committed some sins. I said, can you give me an example? Of course, he couldn't. And finally, I'd had enough. He was about 88 years old at the time. 
And I said, you know something, you're pathetic. I could take everything you know about the Bible and fit it into a thimble and still have room for my elbow. <laughs> a few weeks went by and you know, he apologized to me and I said, I apologize to you. I shouldn't have lashed out at you that way. But after a while, you can't take it forever. He's in a nursing home now, waiting to die. In fact, he would say he's waiting to die. He's got no reason to live. He's proud of the fact that he's never been born again, and he rejects the whole idea of the new birth or trusting only in the Lord Jesus Christ. But like wolves in sheep's clothing, people reject the virgin birth, the very idea. They will either mock the idea of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, or they will entertain miraculous claims made by other people about their religion and think, well, maybe they're onto something too. Try to give those other beliefs credibility. The legend of the Buddha says that the Buddha's mother one night saw a vision of a great white or an, a white elephant coming out of the sky with six tusks coming out of its mouth. Um, and even the stories of this don't all match each other. At least we have the four Gospels. We can match the accounts of Christ's birth, and they're all pretty consistent. But the, the accounts of the Buddha vary from Vietnamese to the Chinese to the Koreans to um, J Japanese Buddhism, wherever you find it. The, the accounts are all different because there are no accurate records. The Buddha never existed. Siddhartha Gautama is a fictional character. He never existed. Let me just say that. If you don't get anything else sitting at home and watching this on YouTube this coming week, get this much. The Buddha is a fictional character. He never existed. The, they want to say that he lived about 550 BC, but the first so-called records of him, the first biographies, official biographies of him, weren't written until 100 AD. And most of them originated in China after the gospel of Christ was already being preached in China. So in a way, we could say the gospel of Christ reached China before Buddhism ever reached China. What they did was they tried to compete with the story of Jesus in Palestine, which was being preached. Thomas took the gospel of Christ to India as early as 40 AD. So they create this legend about one of their own, who had done great miraculous things, and then they tried to make it as though it had been, it was 500 years before Christ, so that Christ would be seen as the, you know, Johnny come lately, the copycat. What they didn't realize was that the wisest man who ever lived besides Christ, Solomon, lived 500 years before that. <laughs> and they borrowed a lot of Solomon's sayings, not realizing what they were doing. But they say, the Buddha's mother had a vision of a white elephant coming out of the sky. The Chinese account says there was a, a rider on the elephant. Who the rider was, what was his purpose, they don't say. But the elephant entered into the side of the woman, and the next morning she was expectant with a child. And then when the time came, the, the baby came out of her side, not through the birth canal, with no amniotic fluid, nothing to be cleaned or washed off, he was perfect, and took seven steps, and as he, he was able to walk and stand immediately out of the birth canal, or out of, the, out of his mother, took seven steps, and right when he stepped, seven lotus flowers sprang up out of the ground as he stepped, and then he declared, I am the last in the world, I am the best in the world. There is no more need for rebirth. But you can see the, the obvious uh, attempt to create this miraculous birth about another religious figure to compete with the gospel of Jesus Christ, which was already being preached. The virgin birth of Jesus Christ was necessary because of Adam's sin. The Bible says, wherefore, as by one man, Adam, Sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so 
death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 5, verse 12. Call it genetics, call it your DNA, what have you. You inherited a nature that wants to sin against the laws of God. King David wrote, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 51, verse 5. His mother wasn't committing a sin when she conceived him, but he means I was a sinner from conception. It was necessary for God to live among men, to walk among men, so he can identify with men. But if he had come into the world the same way all other men come into the world, then he would have had the same sinful nature that everyone else has. So the virgin birth and his conception by God were necessary. Therefore, as by the offense of one, Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Romans 5, verse 18. Not only is the sin nature passed on to everyone born from Adam, but the condemnation or the punishment for Adam's sin is also passed on. The Bible says, Among whom also, the unbelievers, we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Ephesians 2, verse uh, 3. Not only... Uh, did you have the punishment of Adam already waiting for you, but then you lived up to it by committing your own sins. The virgin birth of Christ was necessary so that he could identify with men, but unlike men, he had no sin nature wanting to rebel against God and never committed a sin that needed to be forgiven or atoned for. You never read about the Lord Jesus bringing any sacrifice to the temple in his life to cover his sins. He never apologized for anything he said. The virgin birth was spoken of plainly enough in the scriptures. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The Revised Standard Version got all the liberals excited in 1952 when it said, A young woman shall conceive. Well, young women have babies all the time. There's nothing particularly miraculous about it. God told the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It, her seed, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Genesis 3 Verse 14, I'm almost done. Obviously, women don't produce the seed of conception. Men do, the fathers do. So Genesis 3, verse 15, was the first hint at the miraculous birth of Jesus Christ one day. But that text also predicted that the serpent, or the devil, would produce a seed. I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed. Enmity means hostility or hatred, resentment between two parties. The Bible says, And some believe the things which were spoken, and some believe not. Acts 28, verse 24. The Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6, verse 23. The Bible says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. The Bible says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, verse 12. These two sides, the spirit of Jesus Christ and the spirit of Antichrist have been at war with each other in the invisible, unseen world for the souls of men. God told the serpent, it shall bruise thy head. Boy, I'm looking forward to that day. Do you know him? If you know him, let me hear you say amen. amen. I'm glad that I've trusted Jesus Christ. He saved my soul. He washed me clean from my sins. That if I should die right now, I know I'd wake up in heaven to be with him. 
If you don't have that kind of confidence, that kind of certitude, that kind of, of uh, uh, comfort with that knowledge, then you may need to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and make him the forgiver of your sins. Trust him to save you for all of eternity. Don't leave here with any ifs, ands, buts, question mark about it. It's the most easy proposition to follow in the world, to trust that Jesus Christ died for you. He was punished on your behalf and uh, covered the guilt of your sin. And if you would trust in that, your sin would be covered by him. And his righteousness would then cover you. The great transaction can take place. But to think that the pre-existent God would come into his own creation through the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ is the fundamental basic belief of all Christians. Anything less is the spirit of Antichrist. We should magnify the Lord Jesus, elevate him, raise him up. Dottie Rambo wrote, down from his glory, ever living story, my God and Savior came. And Jesus was his name.